Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what it teaches us about you, about our condition and the suffering that we all endure at some stage and the suffering and pain that we see others going through right now. Teach us, Lord. Give us confidence in you as we look at this topic, Lord, in your name. Amen. If God is good, why is there suffering and evil? It's the last of our Confronting Christianity series. So um, go through uh, Deuteronomy, which is what we're starting next week. Have a look at that. See if you can find an introduction to Deuteronomy. Well, there's heaps online. Read that as well as read the first chapter or so for next week. The tower took years to build and it came down, crashing down in just seconds. It had stood as a symbol of power, strength, security and prosperity. But it came to the ground, sending plumes of dust into the surrounding streets. People furiously worked, pulling the rubble away, throwing it backwards and searching for any sign of life. But the death toll shocked the city. In the days and weeks following, people looked across the skyline for something that they knew but was no longer there. When Jesus talked about this tragic collapse of the Tower of Siloam that killed 18 people, he knew it would not be the last tragedy and he knew, sadly, it would not be the last tower to come crashing down. A New York firefighter spoke of a more recent tower that collapsed. On 9-11, we lost four of our guys from this fire department and one of them was my cousin Jimmy. He wasn't just my cousin, he was my best friend and the best fireman that I ever worked with. He was a good man, dedicated. And every day I drive to work, I drive through my neighbourhood and I see guys drunken fools that I went to school with, standing on the corner, high, having a great old time, and I wonder why these idiots are still walking around and Jimmy is not. And my cousin, he's a priest. He says it's all because God has some great plan, like God's got a plan. You know what? If there is a God, he's got a whole lot of explaining to do. If God is good, why is there suffering? The question of suffering and evil is certainly a serious question, a painful question question. There are, I suppose, two levels of that. The level of the observer speculating on suffering, perhaps chatting over dinner with their friends about suffering. But there's a whole other level, isn't there? The person in the midst of suffering who's been given that diagnosis, whose loved one they kissed goodbye this morning won't be coming home tonight. That's real suffering. And yet through our life we find ourselves in both those positions, the observer wondering and the one in the midst of pain. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible says a whole lot about suffering. It's certainly not 
a hidden topic in the scripture. And our fireman from New York could have quoted many, many passages that express his feelings. He could have gone to the Bible and quoted David in Psalm 13. How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And day after day have sorrow in my heart. The Bible doesn't shrink from the topic of suffering. The Bible actually frequently and very accurately and pointfully and powerfully expresses the depths of pain of the human condition. So why is there suffering? Well, let's have a look. Let's begin at the beginning. In the first two chapters of the Bible in Genesis, we saw that what God made was good. At the end of each day of creating, God said it was good. And on the sixth day after he had created man and woman, he said, ah, that's very good. And we see in those chapters that Adam and Eve are in this extraordinary close and present relationship with the Lord. They're walking and talking together in the garden. It's a beautiful picture. But they are also in relationship with each other and they are also in relationship with nature, with their environment. It was paradise, all relationships, the vertical with God, the horizontal with each other and in our environment working well. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So if what God made was good, why did he have to put the tree there in the garden with all that potential for suffering and pain and death? that we see and we experience in this world. Why didn't he simply create a world without the tree? And it would still be wonderful today, would it not? For God must have a purpose. So what is God's purpose? What does God want from us? What's his desire for us? What does the Old Testament, what does Jesus say in the New Testament is the greatest thing to do, the greatest commandment that he seeks us to not just obey but embrace with all our will the most important thing we humans can do. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, well, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. God loves us and his greatest desire is that we respond back to him in love with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. Our love, our worship and obedience to the Lord is so precious to him, he paid the ultimate price 
for that loving relationship to occur, in fact, to now be restored. So you might be now thinking, okay, God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil there in the garden because he wants our love. (laughs) Doesn't quite make sense. There's something missing. Well, let's keep going. Let's keep thinking about the nature of love. A powerful person can threaten another. They can threaten them to say something, to give them information or else. They could threaten them to stop doing something or to force them to do something. They might want you. And they even might be able to have their way with you. But they can never force your love. Love is the ultimate choice that a person has to give or to withhold. And no torture, no gun to the head, nothing can cause you to give that love. So if God's greatest desire is that we freely respond to him by choosing to give our love to him, God had to create a world where we could exercise genuine choice so we could exercise genuine love, which is the very thing he wants, and love requires a choice. God did not create a world of programmed robots that perform their duties very well but can't love. He created people made in his image, which includes the ability to make choices and also the dignity of responsibility and accountability. We can make moral choices of obedience or disobedience, good or evil, hate or love. Now just think back to that garden. The odds were stacked enormously in our favour to obey. Let's assume there were one million trees in the Garden of Eden. We don't know how big it was. Wouldn't really matter if there was a a million, 10 million, or 800,000. The point was that the Lord said, you can eat any one of those trees, but there's just one, just one that the Lord clearly commanded not to eat, And not only that, he then explained the dreadful consequences if we did eat it. And though it was a million to one, we exercised our choice. And it wasn't just a poor choice. It was a choice of clear defiance and rebellion. And I say we because we have continued in the same vein. Just like Adam and Eve when she was tempted, what did she think? Well, I want to be like God. And we do. We think all sorts of things. I mean, how dare my creator put any restriction on my freedom? What right does he have? How can this God say that loving him should be my first priority when he made a world with so many other wonderful things I could love instead? What right does this God who made my body, who established marriage and family for human flourishing, say that there are healthy boundaries, there are limits to my sexual expression? 
What a hide. I'll march in proud defiance of that. Now, these defiant choices that humanity exercises have painful and devastating consequences for ourselves and for others. The philosopher and apologist Peter Kreeft suggests, I think it's anecdotal, I don't think it's empirical, that 95% of the world's pain and suffering comes through choices we make that harm ourselves and others. The other 5% is the suffering that results in things like earthquakes. These two categories are uh, either human-induced suffering, which is far greater, he's saying, or might call natural suffering. And the earth describes that, the, the Bible describes that as the earth groaning. People might then ask, well, why does God allow the consequences of our choices and suffering to be so great? Why did he just put a sort of a limit on that, put some goalposts so that it doesn't get too bad? Why doesn't he step in and prevent it going too far? Well, the problem with that question is two things. When does he step in and what is too far? Should he cause your engine to seize at five kilometres over the speed limit? We'd all have seized engines. Be very expensive. Or should he, you know, ramp it up a bit, just get the real hoons, you know, those doing 25, 30 k's over the limit. Where does he draw the line in intervening? Every time there's an intervention of God in a way like that, there's a loss of freedom. Well, perhaps God should prevent kids getting cancer but allow it in adults. So what do we do? We, do we draw the line at 18, 16 or 21? You see the problem there. Remember, he has given us the dignity, the responsibility and the accountability of being made in his image and acting like grown-ups. Despite the illustrations I've just given, I do believe that God in his infinite wisdom and providence somehow is preserving us, preventing us from suffering at times that we may not know this side of heaven. The Bible also shows that usually, not always, but usually there is no immediate correlation between sin and a consequence and God's judgment. We obviously see that happening in the Bible, but it's fairly rare. The biblical writers cry out as they see things like the wicked not suffering but prospering, don't they? Why does that happen? It doesn't seem to be the right thing. Where is the consequence of their wickedness? They seem to be spared somehow. Justice doesn't always come in this life, but it will come. And yet the Lord also might be using suffering for our discipline. Proverbs tells us, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. I've found that being a loving parent, I hope I'm a loving parent, is a pretty complex combination of several factors of instruction, of consequence, of discipline, and of grace. 
and knowing which one to emphasise at a particular time is quite taxing. I see a few nods there. <laughs> but if our goal and my goal was, I have pretty long-term parenting philosophy, and that is to produce responsible adults who love the Lord, we shouldn't put a bubble around them to protect them from every hurt. As Peter Kreeft again says, I remember when my daughter was about five years old and she was trying to thread a needle. It was very difficult for her. Every time she tried, she hit herself in the finger and a couple of times she bled. I was watching her, but she didn't see me. She just kept trying and trying. My first instinct was to go and do it for her. But wisely, I held back because I knew she could do it. After about five minutes, she finally did. I came out of hiding. She saw me and excitedly shouted, Daddy, Daddy, look what I did. Look what I did. She was so proud that she threaded the needle that she had forgotten all about the pain. I was wise enough to foresee the pain at that time was good for her. God is much wiser than I was with my daughter. God is wise enough to foresee that we need some pain for reasons which we may not understand, but which he foresees as being necessary for some good. Normally our own good. As James writes, Consider a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. As C.S. Lewis says, God whispers in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but God shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So it's important to consider what God might be trying to say in our pain. Can we hear that megaphone? <laughs> what else is God saying or shouting? At the end of time, billions of people over the millennia were seated on a great plane before God's throne. Most shrank back from the brilliant light before them, but some groups talked with anger and belligerence. How can God judge us? How dare he? What does he know about our suffering? Snapped a young woman. And she ripped open the sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror, beating, starvation, torture, death by the million. In another group, a Negro boy lowered his collar. What about this? He demanded, showing the rope burn. Lynched, he said, for no crime but for being black and strung up. In another group, there was a pregnant schoolgirl with southern eyes. Why should I suffer? It wasn't my fault. 
I was forced into it. And across the vast plain, different groups complained against God for the evil and the suffering that they endured. How lucky it was that God was up there in heaven where it's all light and sweetness. Good for him. What does God know of all the pain that the people have been forced to endure in this world? And each of these groups gathered and they sent forth a representative from their group, someone in their group that had suffered the most. There was a Jew, a black slave, a person from Hiroshima, a horribly deformed arthritic lady, a child that suffered with thalidomide and so many other categories came forward and then they consulted one another on the plane and they presented their case to God and they announced before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they endured. God, they said, should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. And they continued, yes, and let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be questioned. Let his own family think he's out of his mind. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Yes, let him. And let him face false charges. And there he can sit in a court being tried by a prejudiced jury and be convicted by a cowardly judge who cared more about the peoples than the justice. And then why not just let him be tortured like so many of us and let him feel totally abandoned and forsaken? Then let him die such a gruesome and horrific death that there is no way there could be any doubt that he died. As each of these representatives announced their portion of the sentence, murmurs of approval went up among the vast throng. But when the last had finished pronouncing their sentence upon God, There was a long silence. No one uttered a word. For suddenly, all those gathered on that vast plain realized God had already served his sentence. God has not stood back from on high in heaven and watched humanity suffer. His love drove him to enter into the world and there he relieved much suffering, but he also endured the worst of it alongside us. But at the end of the day, a logical argument and even biblical theology will only help so far. Because if you are the one suffering, what you really want more than a good argument is someone with you in the midst of it.
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, writes Paul? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is what you need in the midst of suffering. But there's more. There was another thing that Jesus says that is far more important than our suffering. And he spoke about it in the context of that fallen tower of Siloam. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 that died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Note, Jesus does not say they deserved it. Jesus' questions shows that those that died on those occasions were not worse sinners. They were not more guilty than others. For those particular individuals, God is not rolling out judgment early just on them. We have both cases here of moral evil and of this natural tragedy. And in both cases, the victims were not more guilty. They are equally guilty as the average person in Jerusalem or Galilee, all are guilty. When disaster and suffering strike, Jesus says in this account here, our urgent priority is to acknowledge, number one, our frailty, and number two, our sin. And therefore, to make sure that we're ready for when our life is taken from us. And whether that happens tomorrow on the way to work or on a holiday or in a hospital bed, it's going to happen. Jesus' very clear advice here that he repeats very clearly in verses 3 and 5 is, I tell you, unless you repent, you too will all perish. This is more important than suffering. The appropriate response to suffering and to the prospect of death is repentance. Repentance is a turning away from the self and turning to Christ in humility and confession and coming to that place of receiving the forgiveness that he wants to give us if we would only turn and receive it. 
It is about taking the crown of myself and wanting to be God and putting it on Christ where it belongs as I follow him in love and obedience. And that wise choice means that now no matter what happens, I am prepared for death and for the judgment that follows. It means I am in that loving relationship with the Lord that he always wanted. That was his desire as he loves that we might choose to respond to him in love. We're in that state of love and that is the best state for us to be in. And not only that, it means that we can see suffering from a different perspective as something that my Saviour endured for me and as something that is achieving his purposes in me. And what is that purpose? That we be more like him, that we love him. But it also means the glorious Victory over death. Death has been transformed. Where, O death, is your sting? It is gone. For those who know and love the Lord, it is not the end, death. It is not the final chapter. It is not a full stop. It is a comma into a new and eternal life with the one whom we love and who loves us far more than we could imagine. And the resurrection demonstrates Jesus' ultimate victory over suffering and over death and is that same resurrection that he offers to all those that wisely and humbly choose him. What shall we say then in response to all these things? If God is for us in our suffering, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. You do not leave us hopeless in the face of suffering. We can learn so much from your word. And we see in your word, in that chapter, Revelation 21, you are bringing us back to that place of paradise, all those that know and love you, to that place where there'll be no more crying, death or pain. You made it good. We rebuild. We're suffering the consequences, but you are going to make it right again. We thank you for the knowledge of that purpose, for the knowledge that you can use suffering, for the knowledge, Lord, that you are taking us to that place. And we thank you for what that cost you to do that. Amen.